Hello, and welcome to our pre-lab activity associated with the male reproductive system. Now, the primary structure we're going to be looking at with the male reproductive system is going to be the testes. And so, similar to uh, the ovaries, there's going to be a dense connective tissue capsule around the outside of this organ. Uh, and in both cases, in both the, the testes and the ovaries, uh, that dense connective tissue capsule is going to be referred to as the tunica albuginea. Now, in contrast to what we saw with the ovary, the ovary had a distinct cortex with the ovarian follicles in it and then an inner medulla region. What we're going to see with the testes is essentially uh, a series of walled off lobules. And so an extension of the tunica albuginea, an extension of this dense fibrous connective tissue uh, capsule around the outside, is going to extend into the organ itself, extend into the testes, dividing it up into you know, approximately 200, 250 uh, different lobules. And then within each one of those individual lobules, we'll take a look and there's going to be between one and four seminiferous tubules. And the seminiferous tubules are going to be important because those are the structures that are going to produce the spermatozoa, the male germ cell, uh, the mature sperm cell. Uh, and in between these seminiferous tubules is going to be a loose vascular connective tissue. And more importantly, it's going to be the location of the Leydig cells. And the Leydig cells are going to be involved with the synthesis and production of the hormone testosterone. Now, if we take a look at much higher magnification, what we're going to see within the testes is the seminiferous tubules. And so again, what we've got here is uh, a lumen. Uh, that's the inside of the seminiferous tubule, and it's going to be lined by a very specialized epithelium. It's going to be referred to as a stratified seminiferous epithelium. And so again, uh, we can see the lumen, we can see many cell layers thick. Uh, we're going to have a, a basal lamina uh, in this region here. It's going to be referred to as the tunica propria, uh, but that's essentially just the base layer uh, that's going to be found with this epithelium. And there are going to be two types of cells found within the seminiferous epithelium. Uh, they're going to be the spermatogenic cells, and like the, the name says, spermatogenic, sperm for sperm, genic for birth. These are going to be the cells that are involved with the production of the mature spermatozoa. And again, they're going to differentiate and be pushed up. Ultimately, the mature spermatozoa are going to be released into the lumen of the seminiferous uh, tubules. Now, in addition to those cells that are going to be producing the sperm cells, we're going to have these supportive cells, these super we're going to define them as Sertoli cells later on. But essentially, these are cells that are going to extend all the way across the epithelium, all across the seminiferous epithelium. But they're going to be, in essence, going to be involved with establishing the environment that these developing sperm cells are going to be experienced, experiencing, what they're going to be exposed to, as well as supporting their development. Okay, if we take a look, again, this is a nice high magnification view. You can see the, uh, the laminar, for, or, sorry, the uh, a base lamina in the region here separated a little bit, and that's an artificial uh, kind of factor because of the way the tissue was processed. But normally we'd have that loose connective tissue down in the region here. Seminiferous epithelium, and then ultimately the lumen here. We can see some of the flagella from the tails from the more mature spermatozoa uh, up there to the top. Like we saw in other stratified epithelia, at the base level, we're going to see relatively undifferentiated cells. Cells are going to be capable of dividing and then push some of those cells that are produced up into the epithelia. And as they pass through this epithelia, going closer and closer to the surface, in this case closer and closer to the lumen, they're going to become more and more differentiated. And so what we're going to see is that along this base level are going to be spermatogonia. And these are going to be the, the most undifferentiated of these stem cells, so they're most they're almost generic looking if you want to think about it that way. They're going to be small round cells sitting on the, the base of lamina. They're the least differentiated. They're going to have a nice round nucleus and maybe a little bit of patchy heterochromatin that's going to be present there. The important thing is that these cells are going to continue to divide through mitosis, the normal cell division that is occurring all the way across the rest of the body. Uh, but some of these cells are going to stay as stem cells, stay essentially down here against the base lamina. And other ones, as they divide, are going to be pushed up into the epithelium. And again, once they're pushed up into the epithelium, they're going to start to differentiate. They're going to start to become specialized in developing into a mature sperm cell. So the spermatogonia are going to divide, and some of the products are going to be pushed up into the epithelium, into the seminiferous epithelium, and they're going to become primary spermatocytes. Now, the primary spermatocytes are going to be the most prominent of these uh, cells that we're going to be looking at, the developing um, sperm spermatogenic cells. Uh, they're going to be relatively large cells, uh, large round nucleus, 
uh, almost like a, a patchy or strand-like appearance to the heterochromatin. It may have like a stringy appearance because in some cases you can actually see the chromosomes condensing and the, essentially these cells going through meiosis. And now the primary spermatocytes are going to be in meiosis 1. And so that's these cells essentially preparing to become uh, haploid cells, become mature sperm cells. Um, back to the previous slide for a second. These primary spermatocytes are going to be meiosis 1. So these are going to be these rounder cells, kind of larger cells, located uh, closer to uh, the lamina, uh, per, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, basal lamina uh, in the region here. Once they complete meiosis 1, these primary spermatocytes are going to become secondary spermatocytes. The secondary spermatocytes are going to be in meiosis 2. And for the purposes of this course uh, and using light microscopy, you're really not going to be able to see the cells as being secondary spermatocytes. The cells are also going to go through meiosis II very, very rapidly, so they're not going to be around that long. So the majority of the cells that we see here are going to be primary spermatocytes, and we're not really going to worry about the secondary spermatocytes. But recognize that the secondary spermatocytes are going to be those cells that are going to be going through meiosis II. Once they've completed both meiosis I and meiosis II, they're going to become spermatids. And spermatids are true haploid cells. Haploid for chromosome number and haploid for DNA content. And what we're going to see is that um, the initial products of meiosis II, the early spermatids, are going to look like kind of roundish cells, maybe a little bit smaller than what we've seen before. But these rounder cells then are going to go through the process of spermiogenesis and they're going to differentiate into the production of a mature spermatozoa. And so you're going to go from a round cell to a cell that has a condensed head, the nuclei uh, essentially packed into that head, uh, a lysosome is going to form into the acrosomal cap, uh, we're going to have the mitochondria and a collar uh, around the neck region, and a long flagellum uh, that is going to be there ultimately to propel the spermatozoa uh, when it's time. So all of those changes from that round cell to what would be a mature, recognizable uh, spermatozoa is going to be occurring after meiosis is completed through that process of spermiogenesis. And so again, what we see here are that these cells floating around within the lumen of these seminiferous tubules are mature spermatozoa, mature sperm cells. They're going to be located in the lumen. They're going to be recognized by a very condensed head and a very, very long flagella. Now it's important to recognize that once these cells are sitting here within the lumen of the seminiferous tubules, they're mature, but they're still not capable of forward motility. That'll come uh, within uh, the ductus epididymis. And they're not capable of fertilization. They're going to respond to factors within the female reproductive tract, which is going to allow them to essentially bind to the surface of the egg and fertilize that egg. And so for all intents and purposes, they're going to look mature at this point. There's still a couple developmental processes that need to occur as they're passing through both the, the male reproductive duct system as well as the female reproductive tract. Now, in addition to the spermatogenic cell lines, the cells involved with producing a kind of continuous supply of, of mature sperm cells, we're going to have those support cells. We're going to have those Sertoli cells. So they're going to be elongated. You're probably not going to be able to see the, the branched or pyramidal structure, but you're going to see them as, as having kind of oval nuclei because they're going to be cells that are going to see sitting along uh, the basal lamina, extending all the way to the apical surface, but they're going to be supporting and surrounding all of these spermatogenic cells. We're going to have an oval nucleus, again, the oval nucleus along the length of the cell, so it's going to be oval kind of in this orientation. And in essence, what they're going to do is they're going to connect up with neighboring Sertoli cells establish occluding junctions so that we're going to have two compartments. We're going to have a compartment down here which is essentially exposed to the rest of the body uh, and that's going to be the relatively undifferentiated cells but then cells as they're going through that process of differentiation uh, they're going to be passing higher and higher through the epithelium. They're going to be up here in this controlled environment and so they're not exposed to uh, the ability to generate antibodies against them. They're not going to be exposed to factors like, like lymphocytes. And so, in essence, we're going to have two distinct compartments established by these Sertoli cells. The Sertoli cells are also going to be supporting uh, these cells and helping phagocytose uh, the materials that are being shed as they go from a rounder cell into a, a more mature spermatozoa appearing cell. Now, if we go outside of the seminiferous tubules, again, you've got the stratified epithelium in the region here, you've got the, the basal lamina kind of at this point right in through here. 
in between these cells, uh, I'm sorry, in between the seminiferous tubules are going to be these large cells, pale, maybe a little bit acidophilic, uh, in the loose connective tissue between the seminiferous tubules. And they're going to be a relatively large cell, uh, pale nuclei, maybe one or two nucleoli being present here. And it's these cells that respond to luteinizing hormone and secrete testosterone. And testosterone is going to be important because it's going to be the hormone that essentially stimulates and maintains the activity of the cells within the seminiferous tubules as well as all of the other duct cells within the male reproductive tract as well as having an androgenizing effect uh, on the body. It's a, an anabolic steroid. It has a lot of effects uh, on the body. It's important to recognize that without testosterone, you're not going to have a functioning male reproductive tract. Now, as we go from the seminiferous tubules, we're going to go into the tubular recti. And so instead of being surrounded by other seminiferous tubules and the Leydig cells, what we're going to see is that we're going to end up with tubular recti, straight tubules, which are going to be surrounded and supported by a dense connective tissue sheet. Uh, we're going to start out with uh, basically uh, what cells that look like seminiferous tubules, cells, the stratified epithelium. Uh, but ultimately, we're going to end up with just Sertoli cells or Sertoli-like cells within a simple cuboidal epithelium. And so if you see straight tubules, uh, simple cuboidal epithelium, dense connective tissue uh, around it, these are going to be the straight tubules. These are then going to go into the reedy testes, still aligned by a simple uh, loc cuboidal epithelium, surrounded by connective tissue. But instead of just these straight tubules, you can see the synastomosing network as those straight tubules come together and essentially drain into a, a fewer uh, set of uh, structures, a fewer set of ducts. Uh, they're going to be draining from this region of the testes, the mediastinum uh, of the testes. Now these are going to drain into the ductus epididymis. Uh, the ductus epididymis is going to be a pseudostratified columnar epithelia. Uh, we're going to have stereocilia along the surface, so an irregular uh, lone microvilli along the surface. Uh, so it looks a little bit strange compared to the, the nice cilia that we saw in the uh, respiratory system with the pseudostratified columnar epithelia. So no goblet cells, just pseudostratified columnar epithelia. Stereocilia, again remember stereocilia have a microvilli core, so they're non-motile. Uh, this is the location, a major storage location for spermatozoa. So you can see sperm, uh, sperm, sperm sites uh, within the lumen. You see it in lower magnification on, in various areas through here. Uh, and it's going to be within this region, again, that the sperm are stored, and they become capable of forward motility. So in essence, they learn how to swim in this region. Uh, we're going to see circular muscle gradually thicken along the length uh, of these ductus epididymis, and uh, essentially it's going to become a more muscular organ uh, towards the end of this duct system, the, the ductus epididymis. This is going to go into the vas deferens. Uh, the vas deferens is going to be lined by still that pseudostratified columnar epithelia, Fewer the stereocilia, so it's going to have a little bit of an irregular appearance, uh, but it's not going to be as prevalent uh, as what we saw within um, the ductus epididymis. Uh, the most identifying characteristic of the vas deferens is that we're going to have an incredibly muscular wall structure associated with it. Uh, the vas deferens is going to be the most muscular tube in the body in relationship to the lumen diameter. So you take a look at this relatively small diameter to the lumen, but very, 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 very thick muscularis out here. Uh, and there's going to be three layers of, of muscle cells in that area. Uh, this then is going to go through a series of ducts and go into the ejaculatory duct. Uh, it's going to form by the junction of the ductus deferens and the duct from the seminal, I'm sorry, the, the seminal vesicle. Uh, it's going to be passing through the prostate gland uh, and then ultimately going into the urethra. Uh, within the urethra, we're going to go from an epithelia, which is going to be varied from a transitional epithelia like we saw within the urinary system, to a stratified squamous epithelia. Uh, again, stratified squamous epithelia, uh, small mucus secreting glands of leader uh, in the wall to neutralize the urine that's present there because, again, we've got a genital urinary passageway. So it's the passageway for sperm, but it's also a passageway for urine. Uh, urine in this location would be damaging to the sperm cells and, and damage them or kill them. Uh, and so we got to neutralize the effects uh, of the, the urea and the, essentially the factors in the urine. Uh, the best, the uh, structures we're going to look at, the seminal vesicles uh, have a folded mucosa, low columnar epithelium. Prostate gland is going to have a low pseudostratified columnar epithelium with corpora amylacea, those uh, starchy bodies. Uh, calcium glycoprotein spheres within it uh, that may become calcified. 
This finishes up our view of the male reproductive system. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at 